of being hung in the morning to concentrate the mind the <laughs> night before. And because that was a time when, when you know people would fall, fall out of favor with the king and they would be hung or drawn and quartered or their head would be chopped <laughs> off or whatever they did in those days. Samuel Johnson, yes. The Life of Johnson by James Boswell. Has nothing to do with their last visit. Well, you want to go ahead and talk about the yeah. homework? Yeah. <laughs> the questions? Yeah, I think we, we kind of went over. So, do we need the methods to cut? Like, how do we know that the TXT file is right? the Yeah. So, we don't need to change that file? No. We just need you just uh, import it with the assigned file. All right. Okay. So, about the funding solution. So, there's some actually anti-symmetric. Yeah. It's symmetric. It's, it's, it's symmetric. It's, uh, well, if you don't have anything, use cement. Okay. And do we need to do anything with sliding here? Yeah. 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 You, you need to <coughs> to say which nodes go to what other uh, boxes. So we have to change that microphone. Yeah, of course. You you need to create your own microphone because uh, the case one is just uh, entirely different way. Well, okay. Yeah, yeah. So it's zero. Uh, you remember that uh, the the root and the tip are parallel to the slope. Okay. Because they're parallel, they're, they're only only you want two. To do the board, you want to do it here, and then we'll, we will preserve it for posterity. So okay. why don't you take that chair? So a zero. Uh, uh, okay. So. Here's the flow. It's in the x, x direction, okay. And your your wing is kind of something like this, right? Because the root and the tip are parallel, so there are only two types of information that you have to to give. You have to give this the coordinate of this this point and the the root chord and the coordinate of this point and the tip chord, and that's it. For the macro element, okay. and then then you have to to tell zero how how many panels you want uh, to divide cordwise and spanwise, okay. and then for the spline, spline asks you for uh, say three things. You are doing the I believe it's spline one. It's uh, it's called the infinite plate spline, plate spline. That's used for for wings. Then you have to to tell uh, the set set one list. Set one list is the list of nodes, and then you have to give him the pen list. This is the list of aerodynamic panels, and that's it. Okay. <laughs> you can say it like that. Yeah. <laughs> we keep that micro one point five. The what? Well, I don't know. My no, you, you you change the mark. Uh, you, you you need to find the flutter the flutter velocity. Okay. So you you need to change the aerodynamic conditions accordingly. Sorry. The, 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 yeah, you you are changing the um, when, when you are creating the AAC. Remember this matrix? This is done. We are MK ARZ card. In in this card, you have to to define the Mach number and the list lists of uh, K, K frequencies. Okay. So, so this matrix is generated for this Mach number per each per each k. Yeah, yeah. That's it. Now, this homework is normally due tomorrow. Is that true? Yes. You think we should give them a little more time and mind of those questions? Or not? I don't know. You should. You should, you should ask. No, go for it. No, I'm more done. Well, <laughs> my, the, the, the problem with giving more time is you may just wait that much in the argument. 
Remember what Dr. Johnson said? <laughs> the prospect of being hung in mourning contemplates them all. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Great. Are, are there any other questions about the homework? Danny is available 24-7 by email. It's a definition of graduate <laughs> <laughs> Okay. So um, this is one homework question. We'll label this in case someone ever looks at this and wonder what the heck what this is. Um, we want to talk about nonlinearity and more generally. Uh, we had some brief exposure in the context of transonic flow because I tried to convince you that perhaps when the mock term nears one, the, the classical linear theory of aerodynamics breaks down. Which it, or at least becomes less accurate. And so, therefore, one might need to look at some nonlinearities. Uh, let me give you the big picture now that we're near the end of the course. What we've covered so far, I hope, will give you the background you need to be a practicing neuroelastician. Right? And the fact that you're doing this last homework, you may not look at it quite this way at the moment, but it's a special treat for you because most people who take a course don't get the opportunity you're having to do this homework. And of course, because Danny has some experience, uh, we're taking advantage of that. Um, but having said that, while it's true that linear models and linear theory is what people, for the most part, use today in practice, um, increasingly in industry, there is some concern about nonlinear effects, the real physical effects which require consequent either experimentation or, or uh, theoretical modeling. And in the context of research, for those of us in academia who are expected to do research as well as teach, almost all the research uh, activity today in neuroelasticity is in nonlinear models. Not, not totally, but I know, certainly the, the vast majority. So for that reason, we want to talk about nonlinear areas. And there's things. One is how you construct a nonlinear model, and that is really interesting because while while for linear systems there's a general framework where almost any linear model can be organized within the framework of uh, uh, linear partial difference equations, the corresponding integral equations using Fourier transforms and all the rest of it. Once you get to nonlinearities, there are two major challenges. One is there are many different kinds of nonlinearities, both in structures and and then the aerodynamics. So there are many physical sources of nonlinearities, which we have swept under the rug up to this point for the most part. And then even after you have the right nonlinear model or a good one, how do you determine the solution? Um, if you have the nonlinear model, you can always go to the computer and time march. And you've done a little bit of that already, right? And time march is still works with nonlinear models. It turns out to be a fairly tedious way to get the answer, but you do get the answer. And it's often used because, in some ways, it's conceptually the simplest thing to do. And uh, on the other hand, there are other approaches. We're going to discuss one of those today. Uh, remember, uh, I think I said something like uh, when we do uh, some harmonic motion and then Fourier series and then Fourier transforms, uh, the whole thing is more problematical. Uh, when you have a nonlinear system, and that's true, but all hope is not lost. <laughs> one can still, if you have a periodic time response of a nonlinear system, you can still try to represent it in terms of a Fourier series or even just a single harmonic. But it's a more proximate solution for a nonlinear system, whereas for a linear system, you can always rigorously decompose harmonic by harmonic. When you do nonlinear systems and you only look at one harmonic at a time, inevitably are throwing away some information. We'll talk about that. But this approach, if you will, the Fourier series approach, uh, for nonlinear systems, Is usually called something else. I don't know why, but probably for historical reasons. 
It's usually called the method of harmonic balance. And it can be used for nonlinear structural models, it can be used for nonlinear aerodynamic models, and of course for the combination, i.e., nonlinear aeroelastic models. By the way, uh, the use of, 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 of harmonic balance for structural systems is, has a long history, decades long, maybe even 100 years long. Uh, the literature for nonlinear fluid models is relatively recent, within the last 10 years or so. And one of the pioneers, one of the principal pioneers, is a fellow named Kel Paul, who's a member of our faculty, and he's had a little help from his friends. But, but, but uh, Professor Hall has been the, the leading light of that. And as with many uh, approaches, which in retrospect are obvious, uh, at the time when he first started doing it, a lot of people who had been told that you can only use some harmonic motion for <laughs> linear aerodynamics said, well, you can't do that. Well, of course you can. It's just that you have to get over the cultural hurdle of being told when you were young that it couldn't be done. Okay, so now, but having said all that, we're going to now start off with a nonlinear structural model because it's easier to talk about. And then we'll come back and I hope today or, or next time talk a little bit about harmonic balance in the context of, uh, uh, of a nonlinear aerodynamic model. So we're going to go way back to the uh, so-called typical section model, if you remember what that was. Of course, you will be reviewing this for the final exam. So if you don't remember it right away, by the time you've done your review, you will recall all this. Uh, in the typical section model, where we have an airfoil with a couple of springs, a translational spring, the spring constant KH, and a torsional spring with a constant K alpha, and suitable inertial properties, we have equations of motion that look like this. And then we have minus the aerodynamic lift. And then um, we have the uh, torsional equation or pitching equation, which looks like this. And that's equal to the uh, aerodynamic moment. And what we want to do now is add in the nonlinearity in the stiffness of this model. So I'm going, to add, I'm going to put a one here because over here I want to put a three because I intend to put an alpha cube term in. So this is a so-called, if, if k alpha one and k alpha three are both positive constants, this is a stiffening nonlinearity, i.e. when alpha is small, then I can ignore alpha cube relative to alpha, right? But if alpha is large enough, then this term may become important. <clears throat> and if both of these are positive constants, this stiffness becomes greater as the amplitude becomes greater. Physically, that means that if I go into a flutter condition, once I go beyond the flutter speed, I will have a limit cycle after the transient dies out because this will limit the amplitude. For a given flow velocity, this will limit the amplitude. So um, if I were to draw a, a sketch of alpha versus time, if I start off at a, at a flow velocity that's less than the flutter speed, what will happen, in, even with the nonlinearity, is what happened before, namely it's a stable system, and you'll have an oscillation but, which will then die out. On the other hand, so this is for u infinity less than the flutter speed. On the other hand, if I'm above the flutter speed, According to linear theory, I'll, I, it was the same initial condition. I will now have an oscillation that will grow exponentially in time, right? That's all linear theory can tell me. It can tell me the, the frequency at which it grows. It can tell me the rate, the exponential rate at which it grows. But linear theory says, if I wait long enough, it just keeps getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But with a nonlinearity in the system, what happens is after the transient, let's see if I can draw this without 
doing too much violence. I'll start off like this, and then I'll get up higher and higher. But then I haven't made a real long transit. Rather than this continuing to grow like this, this would be what linear theory would say. Nonlinear theory says this reaches some finite amplitude, and this is the the limit cycle amplitude. And so a nonlinear model will tell us what that amplitude is, and that's really important because I can then say, well, can I sustain that amplitude and at least get back to base? <laughs> Or is that going to exceed the yield stress of the material and is the wing about to fall off, in which case I better bail out or eject or whatever. Okay. So what we want to be able to do is compute that amplitude. Mm -hmm. And one way to do it is do a time simulation. But another way to do it is use harmonic balance. And as I'll try to convince you in the next few minutes, there are some advantages to doing harmonic balance. Namely, you get a lot more information a lot quicker. Now, you leave something out, you particularly leave out the ability to compute the transient. But normally, I'm not really interested in the transient. I'm really interested in the steady state. And that's why I'm interested in harmonic balance. It's fine. If I'm not, if I want to know the transient, then I probably have to do a time march. Okay. So, how are we going to do that? I'm glad you asked. Uh, we're going to do it the following way. We're going to concentrate on these terms because that's the essence of the nonlinearity, right? It's going from a purely linear description of the torsional stiffness to a nonlinear description. And by the way, as you'll see uh, later today, I think today, we can look at almost any nonlinearity within reason. Uh, it doesn't have to be this particular one, but this one's convenient and commonly used as an example. So we're going to do that too. Okay. So let's concentrate on, on those terms. Uh, I mean, there are a lot of other terms, but these are the ones I want to concentrate on. And the way harmonic balance works is the following. We start off the same way we often did in linear system, we're going to let alpha equal alpha bar cosine omega t. And I don't know alpha bar. That's what I want to know. And by the way, this alpha bar is going to be the steady state amplitude, right? Again, I'm, I'm never going to be able to compute the transient. There's no way this can describe this transient, but it can describe the steady state amplitude to some approximation. So I don't know alpha bar. I want to know that. And I really don't know frequency either. After all, <clears throat> Well, if I'm right at the flutter speed, alpha bar is very small. It's almost zero, right? And the frequency is the flutter frequency. So it's not like I don't know anything about these things. In particular, the, the frequency in the limit cycle is often very close to the flutter frequency. So that's good. And that's a clue. But we still need some way of determining alpha bar. So let's look at these terms. I'm going to, this isn't really an equation, but it's a, an expression. It's expression one. <laughs> this is an equation two. I'm going to substitute in here and see what I get. And when I do that, I get, of course, k alpha one alpha bar cosine omega t plus k three alpha bar alpha cube, which is alpha bar cube cosine cube omega t, right? And now I want to do something with this, and what I want to do with this is I want to express this in terms of the usual Fourier series. And from from a trigonometric identity, which I happen to know since I've used it so many times, but I could look it up in the standard reference if you don't happen to know it. Uh, this is equal to, again, k alpha 1 alpha bar cosine omega t plus K3 alpha bar cubed. And then it turns out to be, this is three quarters cosine omega T plus one quarter cosine three omega T. Note that cosine two omega T does not appear, nor any other thing appears except one omega T and three omega T. Okay. So what what is, uh, 
what does the uh, harmonic balance do at this point? Well, I'd say maybe that's not too important. <laughs> okay. Well, is that true or not? Well, um, if you don't do anything beyond throwing it away, you'll never know. Uh, uh, what you, but I'll tell you how we could look at three omega t. Well, one thing you could do is you could always run a time simulation, right? And then you have a time series. You look at the steady state, and you, and you take that steady state time series and express it in terms of Fourier series and see how much three omega t there is in that signal, right? And if you're lucky, it won't be much. And often there isn't. This is often quite a good approximate. Okay. So then what do we do? Well, once we have that. All the other terms in the, are linear, and they all go like cosine omega t. Now, that's not quite true because, remember, there's lift and moment on the right-hand side, and there will be some phase shift. Okay, so there actually are going to be some sine omega t terms, too. But that all comes from, if you're using a linear aerodynamic model, they're all linear. So I really have to balance both cosine omega t terms and sine omega t. Really, to do this. But there's something even better you can do, and that's the following, which avoids a, a lot of effort, as you'll see. What I'm going to do is I'm going to write it this way. I'm going to write this, and I'll have the like that term, K alpha 1 uh, times omega bar alpha bar, excuse me, cosine omega t. And then I'm going to write this as 1 plus k3 um, over k alpha 1. I have to divide by k alpha 1 because I'm taking all this outside, right? And now this is only alpha bar squared, right? Because there's an alpha bar out here. I'm just rewriting this in a form which I know will lead to a happy result. Three oh, three fourths. Thank you. That, that's, you should, should put that in. Although I could say to the level of approximation, it doesn't really matter as three fourths or one, but it, it's strictly speaking, it's three fourths. That's right. Thank you. Okay. Now I look at this and I say, gee, if we were linear theory, it would be just that. But it's not. And so. What does this do? All this does is make k alpha 1, effectively k alpha 1, a little bigger. And of course, it depends on alpha bar. Depends on alpha bar. OK. OK. So now, let's, let's uh, review the bidding. Let's, let's assume that prior to all this, that previously, a linear, strictly linear, flutter analysis has been done. And by the way, note I haven't said anything about the aerodynamic model at all, other than it's linear. It's got to be linear. It can be, it can be zona. It can be. Quasi study, I mean, whatever your favorite area in all. Let's assume we've done that. And let's see, let's assume we have constructed the following curve. Here is U flutter. This is the flutter speed. But the flutter speed depends on all the parameters in the model. In particular, it depends on K alpha 1, right? And so if I've done a linear model, I'd set K alpha 3 to 0, of course, right? So I, I will plot this versus k alpha 1. And I will tell you what this curve looks like. It looks like the following. Okay, There's a minimum. That's the point. There's a minimum. And that's very important. By the way, where does that minimum occur? Uh, if you remember our discussion of linear flutter, I can tell you where it occurs. Let me remind you of the following. Let me define a natural frequency in pitch, which is by definition k alpha, or actually k alpha 1 in this case, 
over I alpha, right? And there's a natural frequency in in bending or translation, which is KH over M, right? A natural frequency squared, right? It, you would not be surprised, I hope, to, to know that the flutter speed will be a minimum or or nearly so when these two frequencies are very close to each other, right? So if I think of a fixed stiffness and bending and I'm varying the torsional stiffness, whenever omega alpha gets close to omega h, that's where this minimum occurs. So this occurs when omega alpha, or if you will, omega alpha squared over omega h squared is near one, which just means that what? K alpha one over I alpha over KH over M. That's near one, right? So that I know I know where that I mean even before I do the calculation, I know roughly where that minimum is. But I will do the calculation, or someone will do the calculation and find this curve. Okay. Now I wore my shirt sleeve so you can see I have nothing up either sleeve. Uh, I claim that with this curve and this expression, I can now construct a plot of the amplitude of the limit cycle oscillation versus the flow velocity. So all I need is a linear flutter calculation and harmonic balance, which gives me this expression. That's pretty good. Don't you think? I think that's pretty good. Okay, so how do we do that? Uh, it depends. Uh, let, so let's assume that we start off doing our linear flow calculation, and and we do that for a range of k alpha. But now we're going to look at one particular k alpha one, and and consider what happens when we start off somewhere on this curve. That's the linear flutter boundary, and then we increase the flow velocity right beyond that point. So you want to do this one over here or one over here? I, I, I'm easy. Do you want to here or here? Do yeah. you want to be over here? Yeah. That's the hard case. All right. So, that was easy, right? so let's, let's assume I'm over here. Okay. So this is now the nominal linear flutter. Velocity. Okay. I'm, I'm, if I'm going to do that, I better. Do that. <laughs> Just so I can make my point. Okay. Okay, now. What hmm? velocity will, will depend on the actual K that you have? Yeah, I'm saying now, I have this piece of structure. I have this typical section model, and it has a linear K alpha one. I, 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 by the way, how, how do I how do I determine the linear stiffness? I put a static force on the system, and I, I bend it in, in pitching, right? And I measure the deflection alpha. And, and for small alpha, it's a nice linear relationship between the applied force and the alpha and for Larger alpha, it, it, it has something like a cubic relationship, and then I so from a static a test, I can determine k alpha one, k alpha three. But I'm assuming now I know k alpha one, and I use that k alpha one to do a linear flutter analysis, ignoring k alpha two. Okay, and when I do that, here here's the flutter velocity. Okay. So, so, so at this point, uh, you have Will be determined once 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 you have the the linear flutter analysis. Uh -huh. Okay. Alright. <clears throat> now now when I when I actually go above uh it's not quite true. Now what I'm gonna do this is the linear flutter velocity. So I'm gonna sort of think in an inverse way in this one, this is the hard one. Now I'm going to think, uh, I'm now considering what happens as alpha gets larger. When alpha gets larger, according to this formula, 
I'm going to call this uh, K effective times alpha bar uh, cosine A. That way I can cancel out that now. This, this, this effective spring constant uh, as alpha gets larger makes K alpha K, K effective larger. Okay, so what I think of happens then is I'm moving down this curve because the effective, if I now interpret this as K alpha effective, rather than K alpha one, same curve, but I now I'm giving it a different interpretation. Now I'm moving down this curve because K alpha effective is getting larger. What happens to the flow velocity? Well, according to this curve, if I'm now down here, did the flow velocity go up or go down? It went down. And I keep going down until I get here, and then it starts going up again. OK. So now I keep that in mind. I'm going to draw you a picture. I'm now drawing a picture of alpha limit cycle oscillation. This is alpha bar, if you will. This is the amplitude of the limit cycle oscillation. It, it was zero, and I'm going to plot this versus u infinity. It was zero when u infinity equals u infinity flutter, right? That's what it was. But then as, as the amplitude increased, what happened to the flow velocity? It went down. So it went down. I'm going to draw this as a dotted line with mouse of fourth rod. And it keeps going down until I reach this point, right? Which will correspond to a certain value of alpha r. And then it starts going up. And, and again, with mouse of fourth rod, I'm going to draw that as a solid line. That's what this mathematics tells me. By the way, if Kevin had given me a break and allowed me to start on this part of the curve, I would have gone through a sim similar set of reasoning, but I would have just gotten a curve that would have gone like that. So this is uh, to the left of the minimum. Sorry about that. To the left of the minimum. And this is to the right of the minimum. Nick, let me go through that too. <laughs> just just let's let's show my because this would have been the easier case to explain, but you started me on the hard case. If I'm over here, right? Now, as alpha bar gets bigger, the K effect gets bigger, and I go up the curve, right? And I just keep going up the curve, and I just keep going up, right? So there's a nice monotonic relationship between amplitude and, uh, and uh, flow velocity. So this is all a stable limit cycle. I'll tell you why they call it stable in a moment. OK. This one, what is it? Well. I, I will tell you, although harmonic balance will not tell you this, I have to use some external reasoning. This turns out to be an unstable in the cycle. And this is also, the solid part of the curve is also stable. Okay. okay. So, if I start to the right of that minimum, I, 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 you might think what, what would happen should happen, namely that that if because it's it's a it's a stiffening nonlinearity, as I increase the flow velocity, the amplitude of the limit cycle goes up, but it goes up in a smooth way, right? This one, this says there's a limit cycle below below the flutter speed, below the linear flutter speed. This thing can go into limit cycle below that 
flutter speed predicted by linear theory. If you if this is a real airplane, that's bad news. That's really bad news, right? And not only that, uh, uh, this amplitude is bigger, right? If I go into them size, there is some good news. This dotted line, again, harmonic balance doesn't tell you this. You have to have some external information. This dotted line is a rough measure of how large I have to disturb the system initially to get into the limit cycle. If Remember what linear theory says? Linear theory says if I disturb this a small amount and I'm anywhere below the linear flow velocity, things will damp out. Well, that's true if I don't disturb it too much. But if I disturb it enough, namely given by this dotted line, the nonlinear effect is to kick it into this limit cycle. So if I if I have an initial uh, disturbance down here, I'm probably okay. But if I have an initial disturbance up here, I'll, I won't go back here. I'll go up here. It's here. I'll go back down to this zero at the transient dice out. But if I'm up here, I'll I'll jump up to here. And what the this what harmonic balance does tell you is there are three possible equilibria. I mean, the trivial equilibria is always an equilibrium. It may or may not be stable, but it's always there. But there are two others. If I start to the left of that curve, okay. Yes. Lower surface, lower nominal. Yeah, well, yeah. Well, yeah. remember what, the, what, the, what this minimum occurs is when omega alpha over omega h is, is sorry, when omega alpha over omega h is nearly one. So when I'm starting to the right of the curve, that means I have a torsional natural frequency that's higher than the bending one, which is normal, by the way. That's what most systems have. But if I happen to have a system where the torsional frequency were less, than the bending frequency, I would start to the left of this curve and get into this more complicated limit cycle. You kind of have that where you can go into the limit cycle below the flutter speed. Below the flutter speed. Yeah. Yeah. That's what this says. I, I can go at the limit cycle below the flutter speed. Does it happen? Hmm? In the other, it well, it does, but not in this not in this simple uh, spring model. I'll tell you the case that happens. Well, let me let me first of all draw the curve here. I'm going to show, um, what am I going to show? I'll show restoring moment. M remember what this is. K alpha 1 plus times alpha, plus K alpha 3 times alpha 3. This is the elastic restoring moment, right? Restoring moment. This is what the way you can look at it is that's how much moment I need <laughs> to twist this to a certain output, right? Okay. Um, on the other hand, there is a case of, which is called free play. Oh, well, let me draw. Let me draw the curve here. So if I I, I plot that restoring moment. versus alpha, right? I just plot this thing as a function of alpha. Qualitatively, it looks like this. It, 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 it's linear, right? It's linear for small alpha, but then it gets larger as alpha increases in either a, a positive or negative sense, right? That's what happens. Now, there is a special kind of uh, torsional stiffness, which is usually associated with control surfaces rather than the main wing, but let's not worry about that for the moment, called free play. Free play looks like this. Uh, yeah, let me use this. Free, so this is, uh, I'll call this the cubic stiffness, right? That's what we're dealing with here. But there's another kind called free play. Free play, what happens is you have something like this. It's zero over some range of alpha. And then it's linear. This is free play. What does this mean? It means that for small alpha, there's no restoring moment at all. Because what happens is, uh, particularly in a control service, you can have some looseness, right? It can 
it can just bounce back and forth between two two small values of alpha. By the way, these are typically very small values. Of alpha. These are fractions, small fractions of a degree. But almost every hinge surface has a little bit of free play. It may be very small, but it's there. Note that these spheres sort of look alike. <laughs> There's a for small alpha, the torsional was uh, k alpha one is very small, namely it's zero, <laughs> if you will, and then then it gets larger as you go. On. So yes, when you have free play, this happens. Uh, so almost any free play system has the ability to have a limit cycle below the nominal linear flux. And uh, there are cases in the literature. Well, the one that is most publicly uh, known is uh, Aviation Week. If you ever read Aviation Week, uh, Airbus and the FAA were having the debate because one of their control services, in the, I think it was the 320, um, but one of the, one of their standard airliners uh, had had a limit cycle oscillation. And they and uh, everybody said, well, it's not flutter; it's it's a limit cycle oscillation. It's not flutter. And uh, the uh, FAA said, well, well, we don't care. The flutter speed you would compute, <laughs> you would compute uh, without out this stiffness would be well below the acceptable level, and you have a problem, and you should fix it. So they debated back and forth a long time. By the way, Boeing has the same problems. It's, it's fortunately for Boeing, they didn't get in, in the public press. Uh, and so what happens is, uh, this problem has been known about a long time. The, the, there's a, there's a, a regulation that says, uh, it, which is really a misunderstanding of what happened uh, based on a regulation that's been in place a long time ago. The original thought before people had any analysis was that what happened due to free play, the flutter speed went down. Actually, that's not what happens. The flutter speed is always there. But due to free play, you can get a limit cycle oscillation over here. This is not really a flutter speed. This is a limit cycle oscillation at a lower speed than, than flutter. So this is still the flutter speed. <laughs> but uh, but originally, people thought this this whole thing moved down because of free play, which isn't what happens. So it, it's that point stays right there, but you can't get it on the side. And uh, there is a question about how how large that amplitude is. Um, and and it turns out we can we can also estimate that uh, without a lot of calculation once you understand what's going on. And there were there were in that. Function. Tell me that again. Uh, you said that uh, you were talking about three equilibrium functions. That um, yeah, there, there are three. There, the one is here, here. Zero. zero. Another one is here. This is an equilibrium point. Oh. It's unstable. Yeah, exactly. it's unstable, but it, it's there. And so, if this floats to be there, there's an equilibrium point here. There's another one here, and of course, there's one up here. These two are stable in the sense that if I give a small perturbation away from that equilibrium, I'll come back to this place or this place. If I give a small perturbation with respect to this, I'll either jump down here or I'll jump up here. And of course, uh, and, and, uh, now harmonic balance won't tell you how, how big that determinant is, but this dotted line is a rough measure of how big the surface has to be before you jump down here or jump here. Uh, Strictly speaking, there's a higher dimensional space because remember, if you think about disturbances, I, at any given point in time, I have to be told what H and H dot are and what alpha and alpha dot are to, to know the rest of the time history in a time simulation. Well, of course, here, all we have is an alpha. We don't have alpha dot. We don't have anything at all about H or H dot. So, so this is only a rough, rough measure. In fact, it turns out when you have free play, uh, even though it's common in a free play in, let's say, pitch, it turns out the disturbance, which determines which, where you go in this range, is actually the disturbance that's most critical, most sensitive, is the disturbance in, in, in plunge. In plunge, in, in translation. No, the, what's, what's in plunge? Okay, all right, fine, fine, fine. Okay, let me go back. Uh, oh, here we go. So let's go back here. Okay, we have these two equations. And let's say rather than a cubic nonlinearity, ah, thank you. 
rather than cubic nonlinearity, we have a free play nonlinearity. Okay, and, and I'm just saying that we can go through harmonic balance, or we can do time march, and we get similar results to what I've described for the case for this case, right? And I'm saying that if I'm if I'm here. And I want to know, do I stay here, or do I go up here, or wh where do I end up at this flow velocity? It turns out that while you, and, and the free play is in the alpha degree of freedom, rather than the h degree of freedom, right? Rather than in the, in the pitch, rather than the plunge, right? I'm saying that, uh, which is interesting, and by the way, harmonic balance doesn't tell you this. Uh, you have to do a real-time simulation to see this. The, the time simulation says that if I give a small disturbance in H, a very small disturbance in H, I'll leap up to this limit cycle. Okay. Whereas a somewhat larger disturbance in alpha will still allow me to come back to here. Yeah, but, but, but the free play is still in, in, in the... But the free play is in alpha. But, but see, there's nothing about harmonic balance that tells me anything about sensitivity to initial conditions. For that, I have to go back to time simulation. Uh, and uh, makes sense. yeah, you know, go ahead. Makes sense. Yeah. Much. Well, uh, what, what we did an experiment uh, and and also did some time simulations uh, and we were correlating. Everything was fine. We we're happy about that. And then we did um, harmonic balance later on, actually, and got the same answer for the limit cycle for these curves, right? But of course, harmonic balance didn't tell us anything about the service. And when we saw how big this was, how big. The disturbance had to be apparently according to alpha. We get up here, we couldn't understand that. And then we went back and actually varied the initial conditions in H and alpha in the time simulation and discovered that the alpha, the H disturbance can be very small and still get up to the slim cycle. And that explained the fact that we never saw, we could never in our wind tunnel experiment, we could never get up to here. We always start jumping to the limit cycle. And, and it turns out that we had enough turbulence in our wind tunnel, have enough turbulence in our wind tunnel, that the disturbance in H can be very small due to gusts or due to randomness in the free stream of the tunnel, and you always leap up the hill. Now, if you've had a very quiet tunnel, if you had a very low turbulence tunnel, presumably you could do some interesting experiments where you could, uh, you know, find this point and then go back here and then disturb it by some means and roughly find out where this boundary is. But, it was interesting. Uh, I probably told you more about that than you need to know at this point. But free play is very common, and uh, maybe I should uh, draw a uh, uh, sequence. One, two, three, four. Um, free play, let me just point out to you what the mathematical model is. Free play, and let's say free play in alpha. You can have free play in anything, H, control services, whatever. By free play, we mean we have a restoring moment. And it looks like this mathematically. Uh, it's, uh, it's equal, equal to zero <laughs> if alpha, the absolute value of alpha, is less than some free play value, right? It's equal to K alpha, whatever it is, alpha minus alpha free play, if alpha is greater than alpha free play, okay? And it's equal to K alpha, alpha free play, oops, alpha, plus alpha free play if alpha is less than alpha free play. So again, let me draw the picture. If zero, oops, sorry. Here's alpha free play. Here's minus alpha free play, right? Uh, and it's like this. So this again is the restoring mode. Uh, 
And so the fact that you can get the, the, these limit cycle oscillations below the nominal linear floor velocity is because the linear floor velocity is based on this stiffness. Okay. Yeah. Now there's another linear floor velocity based on on that stiffness. Okay. But if you go back to uh, oh yeah, here's my beautiful picture. <clears throat> You see, what's going to happen is is that if I if I start up here, if I have a nominal flutter speed up here, I can actually get a much lower flutter speed at some finite amplitude, the three play. So, and so this this minimum velocity point. Is actually this point, right? So with free play, uh, if this if this is the effective free play stiffness, with free play you have to assume the flutter will always occur at the lowest possible flow velocity on a curve like this. Okay, let me say one more thing about this while I'm while I'm thinking about it. Um, we we looked at the case where we had k alpha one alpha plus k alpha three uh, alpha q. Okay. What about other other kinds of nonlinearities? So how do you, how do you actually do the harmonic bumps? Huh? Well, I I told you one way. One one is just to assume. Alpha bar cosine omega t, except in here, and then do, and then use trigonometric identities. But if I had a more general expression, which I think may be your oh, question, I, how do you go from there to, to the actual amplitude? Okay. You invent the expression for k, which involves the nonlinear part. Yeah. How, how do you continue? Well, now wait a minute. I thought I explained that, but maybe not. Okay. Mm. I'm saying that, remember what I said? Uh, well, let, let me start with the easy case first. I'm here at my nominal k alpha 1, right? Yes. Okay. But now I'm going to allow alpha to increase. According to this formula, when k alpha increases, when alpha increases, the effective k will increase, which means I go up this curve, right? So, East, you, I, what I do, uh, using this curve, I pick a value of alpha bar. Initially, I pick zero, all right, essentially zero, so that this term is negligible, and I do a linear flutter analysis using zona, right? Okay. okay. Then I say, okay, I've got this curve. Now I pick alpha bar somewhat greater than zero, and when I do that, then my k alpha effectively goes up, and I move from this point up to, say, this point, and that corresponds to an increase in, in u infinity, and I plot that. So I, I start off here, and then when I do that, my next point is up here. Is that okay? And then I just keep moving up to this curve in the in the simple case, right? I just keep increasing. I just keep increasing alpha bar, and every time I increase alpha bar, I get another point on this curve. It, it, it doesn't tell you when when you go like uh, it can be in a limit cycle only this much. When you increase your alpha too much, you will you will still flutter afterwards. Well, I I'm always oscillating at some amplitude. One way the reason this works physically is because in both flutter and in limit cycle oscillations, I'm in a neutrally Effectively, a nuclearly stable condition, right? I'm I'm at a I, I'm at a uh, a certain amplitude corresponding to a certain frequency corresponding to a certain level of velocity. Maybe I'm missing your question. Mm -hmm. So, it's, so if you are just uh, you calculating alpha, which which will give you the the effective k. Which will give me the effect of the case, which will give me the corresponding 
velocity at which there's a nuclear stable oscillation, which for alpha equals zero is the flutter speed, but for alpha greater than zero is a limit there is a, a slow speed at which a limit cycle oscillation can exist. Okay. Okay. So uh, all I'm doing is I'm 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 moving up this if this is the nominal value, that's 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 the k alpha one when that's when k effective equals k alpha one. Okay, this is the nominal value when k alpha equals k, k alpha effective equals k alpha one. But then as alpha bar increases, k alpha effective is more than k alpha one. So I'm moving up this curve because I'm moving to the right, and I'm moving to a higher and higher flow velocity, which gives me points along this curve. Is that okay? Okay. I, I probably should have done that case first, Kevin. But you asked that I do the other. But the reasoning is similar, but a little more, uh, less a little less intuitive if I start here, because now when I'm here, here's my normal flutter velocity, and now when I increase alpha bar, my k alpha is in, uh, effective is going up, which means initially my flow velocity is going down until I reach this point, which is the minimum flow velocity point, and then I go back up again. This is what happens here. I, I start off here, and then I go here, and I go here, and I go here. Here's my minimum flow velocity from that previous curve, and then I start going up again. Mm -hmm. I see some nodding up and down. Other people are a little more perplexed. Okay. Okay. But. Is that is that help? Okay. Uh, let me uh, talk about other kinds of nonlinearities. Remember what happened in Fourier series. Recall Fourier series. I have some function of time, and I want to express it in a Fourier series. I can either do a sine series or a cosine series, but since we've been talking about cosines. Let's do cosines. Okay. Where omega is the frequency corresponding to the fundamental frequency and the fundamental period of the oscillation, right? Omega is 2 pi over capital T, where capital T is the pre fundamental period. Thank you. Fundamental period of this oscillation. And then we were able to derive an expression for a sub n by multiplying through by a typical term in this series, cosine m omega t, and, use, and integrating over a period, and then using orthogonality in time, right? So the only thing that, that remained was, was one term in this series. And therefore, it, was, it turned out that a sub n was equal to the integral from minus t over 2 to plus t over 2 of f of t cosine n omega t dt. And it turns out there's a 2 over t out in front. Okay. You may or may not remember that, but I'm going to let you, okay? All right. So this is a way, if I have any function of time, this is a way of determining this Fourier series, right, and the coefficients. Well, I can always do this. I mean, remember what I really have. What I really have is I have, I have uh, any nonlinearity is going to be a function, some function of alpha, whether it's free play or cubic or whatever. So I have to write down the function of alpha, but alpha itself is a function of time, right? All right. So you have to tell me what that function of alpha, which is a function of time, looks like, and then I can I can form this operation to determine its its uh, uh, Fourier representation. Um, and I had worked out the free play. Well, you can. No, well, let's let's do an example here. Let's do two examples. We'll do the cubic example. And then we'll do the free play example. Of course, we're, we're going to get the same answer for the cubic example we got before, right? It's just another way of getting the same answer. 
Okay. So if we have alpha cube, right? But alpha cube is alpha bar cube cosine omega t cube, right? And so if I want to compute a sub n, it's 2 over t uh, alpha bar cube cosine omega t cube times uh, cosine n omega t dt, right? Oh, sorry. Right. This is this is f of t. And if you do that, you will find out that a1 is equal to, I remember what, well, uh, I'm going to write down the 40 series up here. You find that a1 is equal to three quarters alpha bar cube. I mean, the alpha bar cube is going to take come outside, right? And uh, a3 is equal to one quarter alpha bar cube, and all other a sub n are zero. Aha. Right? Uh -huh. So this is just another way. If I if I didn't know the trigonometric identities, but the reason this approach is better, or at least more general, is because it may not be obvious. For example, in free play, how you're going <laughs> how you're going to do that. So let's think about free play. Remember what free play was? Uh, it was this. Okay. So what I, what do I need to do in free play? I need to replace alpha by alpha bar cosine omega t. Right, but then when I do that interval over one period, I have three intervals. I have an interval where the function is zero, and I have another interval where it's something else, and yet another interval where it's yet something else. So I have to divide up my period, interval over a period into three intervals and work that out. And it's kind of messy, but it's been done. Okay, it's a great homework. But since you already have a homework problem, I want to sign that. On the other hand, I might ask you that question on the final exam. Mm -hmm. Yeah. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I'll stop there. We're getting close to the witching hour. Um, I'll just mention, and, and, and we'll do this uh, at the start of the next time. You can, without doing any of these detailed calculations, um, Estimate how big the limit cycle is going to be, roughly. Or to say it another way, you can develop a universal curve where you don't have to do the calculation every time you change K3. Okay. Remember what we had, for example, in the cubic case, we had A alpha 1 alpha plus K alpha 3 alpha cubed, plus other things, of course. Well, do I want to go back and calculate every time I change the cubic surface? Do I want to go back and calculate a new lemma cycle oscillation curve? Not if I don't have to. And it turns out by scaling, remember we talked about scaling the other day, by scaling the equations, we can make effectively make k alpha 3 go away in, in, in the mathematical calculations and then have a universal curve. So we'll talk about that next time, and we'll also talk about what we do with our transthonic small disturbance equation. Remember that one? That's the one that has a nonlinear term that goes like this. It turns out that has some very special properties and difficulties, and I'll highlight those next time. Any questions? Any further questions before we conclude for the day? Okay. So the homework is due tomorrow. Is that true? Okay. I